Well, hello. I wanted to sit down today and talk a little bit about YouTube, being a YouTuber, social media and content creation as a whole, and specifically being a YouTuber who makes stuff or a YouTuber in the maker space or the maker genre. And I guess we could call this the unofficial first episode of Stitching in Stories because I'm just gonna sit here and talk and stitch and that is the whole concept of Stitching in Stories. But also this is kind of about Stitching in Stories, so I don't know. And this is not about being a YouTuber for other YouTubers. Like they might find this chat relatable, but I wanted to talk about being a YouTuber for you, the audience. <laughs> Especially if you are the type of person who watches YouTube for entertainment, like it's a streaming platform. I'm one of those people. I come to YouTube before Netflix, Hulu, Prime, any of it. Because honestly, YouTube has for years now had the most consistent and reliable stream of entertainment that I'm like guaranteed to enjoy. And I want to bounce some ideas off of those of you who watch YouTube for entertainment, particularly if you watch my YouTube videos, of course, and maybe even get some advice or opinions from you. I also just feel like smaller or newer YouTubers quite often avoid talking about the experience of being a YouTuber because it can come off as like, complaining or being ungrateful, but that's kind of uh, incorrect and uh, stupid. <laughs> we have experiences too. So here's what's going on. I mentioned last year possibly doing a stitching and story series, a series of videos where I just sit here and work on whatever slow project I'm working on, usually embroidery. Right now it is my Bargello embroidery piece, and tell you a story from my life, or talk about a certain topic, or answer questions. And you may have noticed that it hasn't happened yet. So I put out a poll a few weeks ago asking what you as my audience would like to see from this channel in the coming year, and I threw Stitching in Stories on there, honestly just to be like, hey, right, let's see if anybody even remembers this. Is there any interest in this still? And guess what y'all voted for more than anything else? Stitching in stories. So why haven't I done that? They're so low effort, right? They're so easy to film. And let me tell you, I've got a whole bunch of topics, a whole bunch of stories. I want to make these. But here is the behind the scenes info about being a YouTuber. All of the secrets. Not really, just, just something I wanted to chat about. As a long form content creator on YouTube, which we have to specify now because of shorts, you have several different types of audience member. First up, we have core audience, my heroes. These are people who watch every single one of your videos, usually within the first 24 hours they come out, but at least like within the first week. They are almost definitely subscribed, they might have notifications turned on, and they're the most likely to engage in stuff like commenting, liking, answering polls, maybe attending live streams. And regardless of numbers, whether you are a baby channel or you're Mr. Beast, you have a core audience. If you're watching this video right now, there's a very strong chance that you are part of my core audience. Unless I use a really clickbaity title, in which case, all bets are off. Then we have what I will call our steady audience because I couldn't think of another title. These viewers might be subscribed or they might not. They watch some of our videos, maybe even most of our videos, but it depends on the content. In simplest terms, your core audience watches your videos for you while your steady audience watches your videos for what you do. Now, if a YouTuber has established themselves from the beginning as like a personality channel, I just threw that. Like the old school vlogging kind, then these two things might be almost inseparable. What they do is be them. But let's kind of focus in on the maker genre of YouTube because that is what I am in and that is what I know. Have you heard the phrase niche down to blow up? It's the idea that the more specific and consistently specific your content is, the larger of an audience you will actually gain. I don't necessarily think that this concept is not true, but I do think it's bull <laughs> There are a lot of us in the maker community right now, and I know this partially from talking to a few, but also just from watching people's content, who are really trying to overcome this theory rather than sink into it. Because here's the thing that I think everyone knows in their deepest of hearts. 
humans like more than one thing. And especially as people who make stuff, we are exceptionally likely to have more than one interest, or to gain a new interest, and to want to share that. Sharing is fun. It's what we love to do. It's why we make YouTube content. But the concept of niche down to blow up says, don't do that. It says, you're a sewing channel, so sew. So so. Don't bake. Don't build stuff. Don't make a video essay. Maybe you can embroider because that kind of falls within the same niche, but like, so People expect you to sew. They click on your video because you've sewn. So so. And the viewers that this concept is most concerned with is the steady audience. Oh, our pool guy is here. That's awkward as f Your core audience doesn't care what the crap you're doing in a video. They just want to hang out with you. They like to watch you. You want to chat? They want to listen. You want to try something entirely new? They're up for it. The steady audience, on the other hand, wants to see you do what they are interested in. I am largely seen as a sewing channel, so my sewing videos are going to get more views than a baking video, a travel vlog, a chunk of chatting, because both my core and my steady audience will tune in for them. Now the third category of viewer that you have is a one-time viewer, and for some of these this is a temporary title. Anyone watching a video of mine for the first time is a one-time viewer. They could immediately become core audience. Those of you who start binging an entire library after finding a new creator, that is you. You rock. Or they might become steady viewers. If they don't subscribe and they go on their merry way and they never think about you again, then they are legit one-time viewers. But if they do subscribe and then they go on their merry way and never think of you again, they become the fourth category. The invisible audience. I actually have up to this time referred to this as the dead audience, but that feels a little bit morbid, so... I'm changing the title. Your invisible audience is the reason that your subscriber number on YouTube means absolutely nothing to anyone except basically you as the creator. That number can feel great, but it does not directly correlate to the number of views that you get, and therefore it also does not directly correlate to your paycheck or to the amount of interest that sponsors have in you. And this is why Going viral is not actually helpful if you are trying to build a long-term career as a YouTuber. And quick note here that viral obviously means different things for different channels. Like there is viral viral, but there's also what I call niche viral. I don't know if that's a real term, but like it's smaller than actual viral, but it still very much has an impact on your channel depending on your channel size. Yeah, we're on the same page here, right? Anyway. This may not be true for every YouTuber or every content creator, but for me, and quite frankly for anyone who's trying to build any sort of stability on this platform, your highest priority is building your core audience. The bigger that core audience is, or the higher the percentage of your typical views come from them, the more stability your channel is going to have, and therefore, the more stability your income stream will have. When a video goes viral, you all of a sudden have this massive influx of one-time viewers, and the percentage of those one-time viewers who will become core audience is very small. There's a higher percentage that will become steady audience, and then there's a decent-sized chunk that will subscribe and immediately become invisible audience. And of course, a whole bunch who never come back. True one-time viewers. To be clear, all the different kinds of audience have their worth, and it is perfectly okay to be any of those different categories of audience for any channel. I am core audience for some channels, I am steady audience for some, I am an invisible audience for some, sorry, and I've been a one-time viewer for many. While we want to build our core audience, it is unrealistic to try to convert every single viewer into a core audience member. It's not gonna happen, and quite frankly, it's a really unhealthy pursuit for a YouTuber. Some of you are just here for the sewing content, and that is perfectly okay, I get it. Although you've probably left this video already. Some people aren't going to jive with my content or my makes or my personality at all, and that is 100% understandable and okay and logical. It is okay to leave. I would absolutely love it if you did not scream at me in the comments about why you hated my content before you left, um, you can just leave silently and we'll all go on our merry ways, but that is a whole other rant. The bigger the virality of a video is, the more distance there will be between those percentages of who becomes core audience, steady audience, invisible audience, etc. Which is why going niche viral can actually be a lot more helpful than going viral viral. If the video that goes viral is a really good representation of what you consistently put out, you might have a much higher percentage of 
core audience that comes from it. But if you do something a little bit different, and that is the video that YouTube algorithms decide to push out to the masses, you're gonna end up with a big number of what is technically steady viewers, but who have a different idea of what you and your channel are for. For example, if I most commonly make sewing videos, and then all of a sudden I make a home renovation video, and for whatever reason, the YouTube gods smile upon that video and a way bigger number of people view it, I will very likely end up with a whole chunk of steady viewers who think that I make home renovation videos or at least who are only interested in seeing me do home renovations. And then the next week a sewing video comes up and they're like, what is this? I don't wanna see that. I'm not interested in that. So they don't watch, fair enough. And all of a sudden that influx of views and subscribers you got from that one video just completely disappears. I mean, the subscriber number technically stays there, but again, it doesn't mean anything. Guess how awesome this is for the mental health of content creators. Did you guess super, super amazing? No. So let me tell you specifically about a few things that happened on my channel. First of all, I started this channel as a place to share embroidery tutorials because back in the day, I thought you could only make a YouTube video about something that you were kind of an expert in. Thank heavens for the daring YouTuber who has led the way in making as entertainment in content from a non-expert. Forever grateful. So I had a random embroidery tutorial go viral. I usually refer to it as niche viral, but like, let's be honest, at the time I had less than a thousand subscribers. I was not monetized. Even though the number was half of this, it felt very viral. And I quickly learned that, well, one, I hated making tutorials, but two, tutorials are not great for building a core audience. There's not a lot of people who watch tutorials, like legit, here are the step-by-step, -step, often you don't even see the person kind of tutorials for entertainment. You typically look up a tutorial when you need the information because you want to try that. So tutorials can go viral, they do all the time, because a ton of people suddenly want to try that thing, or as was in this case, it just shows up on a bunch of people's homepages. They can also build huge numbers of views over time if they are something that people frequently look up. But it is really hard, at least from what I've seen, to have consistency on a tutorial only channel. I mean, I would not watch my own embroidery tutorials unless I specifically needed to know how to do that stitch. They're informational, not entertaining. When this video went viral, I pretty quickly gained 50 thousand subscribers. It's a lot. To this day, those are almost entirely invisible audience. I'd say that the core audience I gained from that is probably about 50 people, less than 0.1%. First of all, because of what I just said, tutorials aren't great for building a core audience, but also because I didn't want to do that. I started making more project vlog style videos that not only could not be called tutorials because I didn't want to make tutorials and were focused much more on personality, but also explored other genres. First macrame, then sewing, and then I was baking, I was making candles, I was woodworking and doing stuff with concrete. Any steady audience that I had gained were out the door. They were like, this is not at all what we wanted or expected from your channel, and they never clicked again. And this is why for over two years, I had more than 50,000 subscribers and would average about 500 views per video. That's a massive discrepancy. And honestly, I will have to grow a lot more before that discrepancy goes away because even now I have those 50,000 invisible subscribers. Only guess what? Now I have a whole lot more invisible subscribers, yay! And that is largely thanks to shorts. You may have noticed, but honestly probably didn't if you are a long form content watcher, that I stopped posting shorts on this channel. I had started posting them when I first got some traction here, which crazily enough, is still only like six months ago, y'all. I already had reels for Instagram. Some of them had gone viral over there, which is whew, a whole other thing that we will not get into right now. Let's stay focused on YouTube. So I was like, hey, why not? YouTube is pushing us to post shorts. I'll just put one a week over here. It'll be like a follow up to the video and people will maybe see that reel short, <laughs> see that short and go check out the long video that has to do with it, right? So naive. Things did not work out as I had hoped. 
Ugh. Yo, that's the first time I've done an incorrect stitch. That's not bad. Several of them went viral, and because we have been conditioned to think of virality as a good thing, I'm sure you're like, wow, great, that's awesome for you. Mm -mm. Nope, not helpful. Let's just go straight to the wallet of the whole thing first. YouTubers make very, very little money off of shorts. In 2023, 2.5% 2 of my AdSense revenue from YouTube came from shorts. Everything else was from long form content. Now, long form content can really, really vary on income levels just because it varies so much in what it is. I have the benefit of making long, long form content. Like most of my videos average at 30 minutes, which means there's gonna be more of those in, in the middle ads that everybody hates. Sorry. They pay my bills. And I don't put anything in my videos that can get flagged in any way, whether from like another company or something claiming part of the uh, income because I use their images or their sounds or whatever, or because I put something controversial or more adult in my videos, which can also mean that certain companies don't want to play their ads before your videos and therefore your revenue goes down. I don't do any of that. So my income is pretty solidly stable from my long form content. Also, the analytic that YouTube likes to push on us is average view duration, which I don't find super helpful. The one that's more interesting to me is how many people have actually watched your video all the way to the end or close to the end, which for me usually is like 50%, which is pretty high. Interesting to note though, the more views I have on a video, the lower that percentage becomes. Oh, nope, did a wrong one again. For example, the video where I tried Instagram sewing hacks has at this time about four times my average views, but the percentage of people who have watched it all the way through has dropped to 30%. Anyway, that's just a few of the uh, really fun numbers that we get to stare at. Usually way too much. Back to my current point. If a long-term video goes viral or even niche viral, I may end up with a lot of invisible subscribers and a bigger discrepancy between my subscriber number and my consistent view count, but I'll at least get decently compensated for that virality. Which, um, <laughs> let's be honest, just, just lightly makes up for the terrible comments that you get anytime your content is pushed out to a new group of people who are just so very, very angry that they were forced to view it by no one. When a short goes viral, you get pretty much nothing, except all those terrible comments. So I had a couple times in the several months where I was consistently posting shorts that either one was going viral or YouTube was pushing out several of them simultaneously, simultaneously into like niche virality. And each of those times I gained another chunk of invisible subscribers. Yay. These are kind of the worst kind of invisible subscribers. And I don't mean this as a personal insult to anyone who's ever followed a channel after just seeing one short, but like, it's the whole reason your followers don't matter on Instagram either. That's just not the way that short form content algorithms work nowadays. You're no longer encouraged to follow or subscribe to someone because you want to see everything that they post. In fact, I begin to question what the point of following is at all if you're just gonna scroll through the Reels feed and be fed whatever content the algorithm wants to feed you. And I don't know how much this applies to TikTok because I have never ever had it, but I assume from what I've heard that it's basically the same thing. And I don't really watch YouTube Shorts either because I don't need to diversify the platforms that I use for doom scrolling. But that seems to be what's happening with the YouTube algorithm for Shorts as well. People who subscribe to my channel after seeing a short generally have no idea who I am, what I do, or even that I make long form videos. A very, very small percentage might go look at my channel and see that I do in fact make full length videos, but an even tinier percentage of those people are actually going to click on one of those videos, watch it all the way through, decide that they like it and go watch more. So the core audience that I gain from a viral short is somewhere between minuscule and non-existent. And therefore, the discrepancy between my subscriber number and what my consistent view count tends to be has grown larger 
and larger. And honestly, I wish I had never posted them. I'm not gonna take them down right now. I might eventually, but right now it kind of feels like it's just too late anyway, so why bother? But YouTube Shorts have done theoretically nothing helpful for my channel. If you are a core audience member who found me via YouTube Shorts, now is your time to raise your hand and make it all worth it. Cause like, that's my saving grace is like, if even one person found my channel and was inspired to try something new or to explore a new area, to fearlessly wing it and make something, then okay, it was all worth it. But I will not for the time being and possibly for all times being be posting any more shorts. I would much, much rather have a very slow trickle of incoming subscribers who are actually core audience or at least steady audience than suddenly gain 50,000 new people who I am never gonna hear from again. So what's my main point here? <laughs> Stitching in stories is outside of my established niche, despite having stitching in the title. And I put that in quotations because I don't want an established niche. Being in the maker space, the maker genre and community is fine, okay, but I do not want to be classified as a sewing channel, much less a tutorial channel. I'm not a tutorial. I have kind of just fallen into that because I got obsessed with sewing, but there are so many other things that I want to do and try and share. I wanna be an entertainment channel that is creativity themed. I want people to watch because it is fun to watch and it inspires you to be creative and it encourages you that you are capable of making things or maybe just because it's nice to hang out with somebody while you're crafting on your own, not because I'm gonna teach you some things. <laughs> Lord. Months ago, I was looking at my channel and my brand and just, you know, my plans for the future. And I came up with what I guess I would call a motto for my channel. 50% entertainment, 50% inspiration. And if you learn something along the way, that's just a bonus. I was finding myself getting caught up in these requests, mostly from Instagram to be fair, for information, instruction, patterns and tutorials. And it was unsurprisingly, because I've been here before, I know the drill, making me a lot less excited for my projects and for my videos. And I think that's quite often reflected in the videos that I made. So this year, I not only want to try new things, explore new things, we're doing home renovations, y'all. I haven't done a baking video in a while. I should do that again, right? But I'm also stepping out of my massively introverted comfort zone and doing collaborations with other makers because y'all, the maker community is awesome and the people in it are awesome. And I might still make a tutorial-ish video every now and then, but I really want to get away from teaching or instructing in my project vlogs and instead just show you what I'm doing and be excited about it and go on tangents and get to know you in the comments and just share. And this is a bit of a tangent in itself, but my journey in accepting myself as someone who likes to talk has been quite a roller coaster, especially in this last six months. Every single one of you who has left a comment saying that you love the tangents, you miss the tangents, or who is just engaged in the conversational aspect of my videos in any way, quite seriously, thank you so much. Elise Myers said in one of her podcasts, and she said it so matter-of-factly that it lightly blew my mind. Uh, to paraphrase, she said that she's never been good at conversation, but she is good at monologuing and at storytelling. And like, yes, 100% same. But I struggle so much with accepting that as something that is okay or possibly even like a positive aspect of myself. I mean, I definitely was told many times as a child that like children should be seen and not heard. But when I was 12 or 13, I made a very conscious decision to stop talking as much as possible. And this was massively a coping mechanism because I could not stand any form of conflict, confrontation, getting in trouble, being a bother, light debate, any of it. And I saw myself entering teenagerhood and I saw all the stereotypes of what teenagers are like and what theoretically I was about to become. And I saw that my mother 
Um, she hit menopause right as I entered my teen years. It lined up great. And I convinced myself that it was better for me to talk as little as possible, to never offer my opinion, to keep all of my thoughts to myself, than to cause any amount of conflict in our home. And I convinced myself of this by imagining what a cool, mysterious, quiet young lady I would be. And how one day some magical, adorable boy would take notice of me and take the time to get to know me like you do with a stray cat and just break down all of my walls and then it would finally become known to the world how frickin' wise I was. Do you ever look back and realize that you had coping mechanisms for your coping mechanisms? Anyway, this combined with some other childhood stuff that we don't have time to go into right now is what locked me into this mentality that I should not talk. That if I start talking, I talk too much that I overshare and no one wants to hear that. And then I discovered a couple years ago that I absolutely love talking to a camera, monologuing. Wow, it's almost like I have 15 years of thoughts bottled up in my brain or something. But like, it's been tough to accept myself as not a mysterious quiet person, but rather a chatty person who has tons of random thoughts that they love to monologue about. And unfortunately, there are a few of those one-time viewers and Quite honestly, it's not that many. So many more of you are supportive and kind. But there are a few who have very pointedly told me that I talk too much in my videos, that they didn't need to hear any of that, that I should get to the point, that I should shut up, or, and quite frankly, this is the one that I should not have read, that I am self-obsessed and egotistical because I won't stop talking about myself. To which the logical side of my brain is like, who else would I talk about? I only know me. Out of all of the rude or condescending or negative comments that I get, these are the ones that bother me the most. And I am working overtime to move past that because the reality is I wanna be a person who talks on the internet. I wanna make stuff because making stuff is super fun, but I also just wanna talk sometimes. I wanna tell stories, I wanna share thoughts. And because, <laughs> well, because I'm female, there are always going to be people who say that that's not okay. And I just have to get to a place where I give zero fucks about their opinion. The logical side of my brain is 100% there. The emotional side of my brain is like 70% there, which it's come a long way already. So, stitching in stories. Am I gonna do it? Probably not. I know, what? Probably not on this channel. Because here is the culmination of my YouTuber insights. When you make a video outside of your niche, it is very likely, in most cases, going to get fewer views. And prior to the last six months, I would have said, who cares? Why does it matter if one video gets fewer views? It doesn't, not to me really. I have been blessed with a large enough and a stable enough core audience that generally every month I make a living wage off of my weekly videos, even if the views are a little lower than normal. So if I put out a bonus video once a month that engages with my core audience and satisfies my itch to storytell, that's fine, that's totally fine. Or it would be, if not for the algorithm. The algorithm runs our lives. I mean, I used to wonder when I would hear bigger YouTubers be like, oh, I don't post that kind of video anymore. Insert whatever outside of niche video it is here. And I'd be like, dang, does it really affect your income that much to have one lower video? No, but it does affect your next video. One video with lower views means that the algorithm pushes out the next video to fewer people and then that one gets lower views, and so then the next video gets pushed out to even fewer people. And this can lead into a downward view spiral that lasts for weeks and very much does have an effect on your income. But even if we throw income aside, like, psh, let's forget we have bills to pay. Not everything is about money. It's also just super downheartening? Down, down, down heart? Mm creating of downheartedness? <laughs> Depressing for us as the maker. It's very out of our control and we don't know when we'll fix it or even if we'll be able to fix it and get back to the stability that we had before. It can lead to burnout because it suddenly feels like you have lost all of this progress that you worked really hard to build up. And that's from doing one out of niche video, which like, pfft, I'm gonna be doing, cause I don't just wanna sew here. But if I start posting consistently a chatty video once a month, which is what I'd like to do, the possibility of that having a very negative effect on the rest of my channel is so unfortunately 
very high. Many creators have moved their more personal or out of the box content to platforms like Patreon. Your core core audience who really want to see it can go view it over there and it won't have an effect on your channel. Some people use live streams as a way to have those chattier moments and engage with their community and those also go in a different folder and don't affect your regular video view counts. And those are both options for stitching in stories. I don't really want to do the whole series as live streams, not only because not everybody can or wants to attend a live stream, but also because some of the stories that I would like to eventually tell are a little more complex and nuanced and I like the power of editing. But I could do a Patreon exclusively for stitching in stories. I'm also considering putting that series on a second channel or making it a podcast. Everyone's doing podcasts these days. But if I'm just going to be talking, then it is a medium that could work really well for that. I could also potentially do both of those things. I could make it a podcast, but then have a second YouTube channel where there's the visual version for those who want to actually see the stitching progress or who need subtitles. There's a lot of potential for guests and collaborations within the Stitching and Stories concept as well, which is really exciting for me. Collaborations are difficult to plan and coordinate for making channels. A lot of us really want to do more, but are just kind of struggling to make it happen. So a place where two or more makers could get together even from a distance and discuss a topic or I don't know, get to know each other, that could be super fun. So this is what I've been thinking about for the last few months. And honestly, it's a little bit nerve wracking sharing it with all of you. Uh, it's always weird to peel back the curtain a bit and show you behind the scenes. Like I love behind the scenes. I wanna be all up in everybody's business, but I'm never sure if it just comes across as like, way too much information, or maybe I just feel like I talked too much and I should get over that. I would genuinely love your opinions though. I'd love to hear from you, especially if you are a core audience or if you think you might become core audience of a Stitching and Stories series. This is something I'm really excited about, but all of those options, Patreon, live streams, podcast, second channel, those are all very new and therefore they feel very much like starting from scratch. And part of me is like, honey boo boo child, you are not nearly established enough right here on this main channel to start dreaming up other stuff, like take a chill pill. But that is my realistic, logical inner voice, which God love her, she keeps me sane and stable, but like sometimes she needs to take an excited pill or something. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed hearing some of what it's like to be a YouTuber or I don't know, to stare at a bunch of numbers all the time and have no control over them. In the interest of behind the scenes, the great need to make this video came over me randomly one night, but I could not film it at the time. So um, I sat down and wrote this entire script in an hour and a half when I should have been eating dinner and doing the dishes. And just writing it made my heart race a little bit. So if this whole thing actually makes it up onto my channel, good for me. This video was very lacking in puppy, so here he be. Oh, dummy. Later, taters. I should have clapped, shouldn't I? Too late. Inkabaga udvigi. And this can lead you into a downworld spiral. Downworld. Oh no. <laughs> and maybe even get some. Ugh. Come on. I don't necessarily think. <clears throat> And I'm not wearing glasses. The bigger the virality of a video is, the more distance there will be. This one's gonna be a hard one for me to get out, but I'm gonna do it. Oh, my leg is dead. You're gonna hate lining up these videos. You should really do a clap.